This morning's scripture comes from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it was written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. The word of the Lord. We got palms. Welcome to Middleburg Baptist Church 2021, our Palm Sunday. Thank you for joining us as we begin together the Passion Week. This upcoming Friday, if you can join us at 7 o'clock, we are going to have a Good Friday service online only with communion. Got some wonderful music, some scripture. There'll be some teaching, some video. It will really help you understand and inspire you to respond to the love that Jesus Christ has given to each one of us through his obedience to death on the cross. And we're not going to stop at Friday because Sundays are coming. Sunday we will have a service where we celebrate the risen uh, Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're going to have you know two services, one online at 9 and then one outside at 10 a.m. If you're local, please join us for that. So Palm Sunday is really uh, an interesting thing. Uh, it's Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it really starts off this incredible week. And in fact, this one week, the, the Gospel of John takes a third of his Gospel and talks just about this one week. Pretty incredible. And the uh, all four Gospel writers record and uh, talk about Palm Sunday. Now, what was going on in Jerusalem at the time was one of their many homecoming feasts. There were three that they would come home for. There was Passover, there was Pentecost, and then there was Tabernacle. So everybody living in a reasonable distance, but some would actually travel many miles to come home uh, to Jerusalem to celebrate and commemorate um, the, uh, the Jewish Passover as they departed out of, of, of Egypt. And here's what's interesting is that every family was required to sacrifice a lamb for the Passover. Now, 
In Exodus chapter 12, our, my small group on Wednesday nights, we've been uh, going through the, uh, the, the book of Exodus. So this is really fresh in our minds because we just studied this. But there were 10 plagues in Egypt, and the very last one was the plague that an angel of death would, would roam through, would just kind of like as a haze or a darkness, would go through Egypt and anyone who did not have the blood of a lamb, lamb's blood sprinkled over the doorposts, um, if you did not do that, then your firstborn would be killed by the angel of death. Now, everyone who sprinkled the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, the angel of death would pass over them. And many of you have watched The Ten Commandments. It's a movie that our family will often watch every, every year about this time. It portrays a really interesting uh, picture of all that was happening there in Egypt at the time. But in Jesus' day, when all of these sojourners and out-of-towner uh, folks would be coming home for the homecoming, the Passover homecoming. They would need to oftentimes purchase a lamb from the temple. And so the temple would, would this was kind of a moneymaker for them. I hate to put it in those terms, but it would cost a lot of money and you'd have to convert your money from out of town into the temple money. So they had kind of a thing going there. And Josephus, one of the early Jewish uh, historians, uh, claimed that uh, there was a time there in Jerusalem that they sacrificed 250, or they sold 250,000 lambs. And if you just kind of put, you know, uh, 10 people for per lamb, because, you know, one per family, you're talking about a couple million people that would ascend into Jerusalem to commemorate and celebrate the Passover. So that's kind of our context this morning when we're looking at uh, John. And uh, if you haven't had a chance yet to, to look at our sermon notes, you can follow along there on Facebook. We've uploaded them. And we're going to start this morning in John chapter 12, verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and they came, not only because of him, but they also came to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead just days before. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing them. Now this word believe is the Greek word pistuo. It, it, it's where we get the word faith. It, it means to have trust in. And so individuals were placing their faith and their trust, according to the Pharisees, in, in Jesus. And this was something they did not want to see happen. You know, our beliefs determine our actions. I, I mean, it's, it's kind of a simple thing, but what you believe determines how you act. If you don't believe that brushing your teeth is going to help uh, prevent tooth decay, then it will result in certain actions about oral hygiene. But beliefs determine our actions. You know, today, if you're online, there's conspiracy theories. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing. There's, you know, depending on uh, the news station you watch or, or just gossip, but sometimes when we get information, it'll change our belief, and, and oftentimes that will interpret or lead us to actionable uh, moments. And you know, for example, you know, right now we're in the COVID-19 and the vaccine is available. So let me just ask you, just for fun, let me ask you what your beliefs are. Do you believe in COVID-19? Do you believe that there is a virus that exists, uh, COVID-19? Well, I think most of us do. Do you believe that a vaccine exists? Okay, and then the next question is, do you believe that the vaccine is safe? And don't, don't get too worried about which one. We're, we're, we're just talking about in, a vaccine. Do you believe that taking the vaccine in your arm will help protect you from contracting and getting the virus, COVID-19? Do you believe that the vaccine will protect everyone? And I think 
Most of us would say yes. And so here it is, personally speaking, if you believe that, have you signed up to get the shot and follow up? Will you go get the shot? Now, I'm not talking about certain people who are trying to get pregnant and, you know, and I, I know there's different folks for different reasons that they would say no. But here's what's interesting, and here's the question. Do you believe that the vaccine can ultimately save your life from the possibility of getting COVID-19? See, if you would say yes to that, then you'll probably be like me and you signed up and I'm going to get my first COVID shot next Tuesday. How great is that? I'm really looking forward to, to that. I'm really looking forward to getting back out and not having to be concerned that I might be a part of that small percentage that contracts it and dies. I, 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 don't, want, I don't want that to happen. But let me put my pastor hat on for just a moment. Because the crowds that were surrounding everybody there in Jerusalem, not about COVID, but they had a belief in Jesus. And the belief that they had was based on what had happened on the sign of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus, let's, let's get personal here, do you believe that Jesus is a real historical person? I've met some people and they've said, no, I, I don't believe Jesus was a real historical person. Well, then that's our first place we have to start. But let's say you said yes. Then do you believe that he, being a real person, it, was he just a prophet? Is he just a good guy? Or do you believe that he is the savior of the world? Do you believe he is the son of God? That would be the next question. And then do you believe that he was arrested, and he was given a death penalty and hung on the cross and then died, buried, and then ultimately, do you believe that he rose from the dead? And the, the, the question is, what do you believe? And, and here's what's interesting is I've found many people throughout my pastoral life and they've said, yes, I believe all of that. And then I will ask them a question, are you a follower of Jesus or have you trusted him to take your sins away? And they would say no. And, and, and it's like somebody who is leading down the whole road of the vaccine and they would say, yes, I believe all of that, but I just won't get the vaccine. So then my question is, do you really believe? And belief is supposed to lead you to actions. And my encouragement for all of us is that once you get to the door and you say, yes, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I believe that um, his death on the cross can remove my sin, well then you got to take the next step and ask him to be your personal Savior. See, this isn't just intellectual assent. This is where we want to step through the door of faith and say, yes, I trust you. Are you trusting Jesus as your Savior? Are, are you relying on his death and the full payment for your sin debt? Are you depending on his resurrection as a guarantee that you too will be raised in eternal life after death? What do you believe about Jesus. And has that belief affected your actions? And then lastly, let me just ask this, what is your basis of belief? Do you have any citations that you could kind of point you that would be the foundation of your belief. Well, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And look at what verse 12 says. The next day, this would be Sunday, um, the great crowd that had come for the festival, uh, the Passover festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches, they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Now, this word Hosanna, it actually means save now. Save now. 
these palm trees were around, and so it wouldn't be uncommon to, uh, to see them not only in Jesus' day, but there today. Here's what's interesting, and that I, I kind of want to point out, is that as Jesus is coming in, and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now. Everyone has bright, shiny uh, faces. There's anticipation. Here is our Messiah. They couldn't be more happy because of what their belief in what Jesus was going to do. And here's the problem, is that they had a nationalistic picture, view, thought of who Jesus was and who the Messiah was. You see, the crowd's belief was more of a military type leader and that they would eventually be able to overthrow Rome. They weren't looking for a messianic spiritual leader, or they weren't looking for the Lamb of God. So here they are, they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel. And these are all messianic uh, fulfillment of like Psalm 118, 28. And so you see all these cheers, but there's also jeers right there on the side of the, the road and from the Pharisees. Luke records this in Luke 19, some of the, uh, verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, these, quiet, these stones will cry out. What a picture that's going on here. Verse 14, so Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, here's another messianic fulfillment, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. There are a couple things about donkeys that are pretty interesting. They can live 30 to 50 years old. Uh, they are unlike horse hooves. They actually have hooves that don't need to be um, um, shooed. They, they're really, really tough, which would be perfect and ideal for Jerusalem. And the whole area there is just rock. If you've ever been there, there's so many rocks. And donkeys are herd animals. They, um, it's not good to have just one alone. You need to have a, a couple of them um, because they don't like to be alone. I, donkeys are great. I think it's amazing that John quotes many times from the Old Testament about the scripture to affirm who Jesus is because it's not who the crowd said he was. It's not who uh, the Pharisees said he was. It's who the Bible says or who the Old Testament messianic scriptures said who Jesus was as it is written. In fact, 400 to 500 years prior to this, Zechariah, the minor prophet, wrote in Zechariah 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, see your king comes to you riding victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is one more fulfillment of the Messiah. He is the Messiah, and he is fulfilling so many prophecies beginning right here. He did many before, and he's going to continue to. But the crowd didn't understand. The disciples didn't even understand, which might be surprising to a lot of us. Look at verse 16. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. They didn't understand. They didn't realize how many times have I read a passage over and over and all of a sudden something brand new just jumps out at me that I hadn't connected the dots before? On social media, there's times that I'll be scrolling through probably like you do at home. How old were you when you first realized that the lines on the red solo cup are not just random, but they actually represent certain ounces of a beverage you could put in there? When, when were you, how old were you when you first realized the red solo cup was, could be used as a measuring tool as well? How old were you when you realized that the car gas tank actually has a little arrow that tells you what side the gas tank is on? Again, 
just trying to be funny here, but the disciples didn't understand. They didn't realize it. Here's my question for you. When did you first realize, or when did you first really fully come to understand that Jesus was the Messiah? That not just some external you know, event that happened in history, but it's personal to you today that he is your personal Savior. When, how old were you when you first realized that? And many of us will say at different times, but just kind of an interesting question because again, let me just say it again. The crowds looked for a Messiah who would lead them politically and free them nationally from Rome. But Jesus came to free them spiritually. And that's what they were doing. Here on, on Palm Sunday, they're nationally just kind of Here's our Messiah, and he is going to save us politically and militarily. He is going to be our national leader. But they weren't realizing that he only came to be able to buy their and redeem their lives so that they could spend eternity in heaven. John chapter 12, verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed the sign, went out to meet him. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, you can just kind of, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. What do they mean by that? The whole world. Well, remember, this is homecoming. And so the whole world, there were people coming from way up north, way out, you know, uh, west, uh, on the other side of the Mediterranean, people would be coming home from the south. I mean, so um, if you were Jewish, you would come home for the Passover. The whole world was coming here to the Passover. And... These Pharisees were saying, look, the whole world is going after them. Now, the date here on the calendar is probably Nisan 10, the Jewish calendar, Nisan 10. The Passover lambs would be sacrificed on Nisan 14. Now, here's what's interesting, is that this would be the time that families would be picking their lamb to sacrifice for their meal coming up on the Passover. Isn't that interesting? Verse 29 in, in John chapter 1, the next day, because you know the whole Lamb of God and just this image and, and portrait, um, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward them and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the very first chapter of John. This is the one I meant, he told his disciples, when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. You see, when Jesus is entering into Jerusalem on this donkey, and the crowds were looking at this as a nationalistic, you know, military, political kind of thing, he was entering in to fulfill his purpose and that was to be your Lamb of God. It was to be my Lamb of God. And what's interesting is that would have been the day that most Jewish families would have chosen their Lamb for the upcoming Passover meal. Again, the crowds were looking for a Messiah who would rescue them, but not save them spiritually. On Passover Sunday, Jesus enters in through this east gate to fulfill his divine purpose. Now, if you ever go to Israel, uh, oftentimes there's a, a, some great spots over on the Mount of Olives, and this is what you would see as you're looking out at, uh, at what they call the, the east gate. And they believe this is the gate that Jesus would have entered into on Palm Sunday. And here's a closer image. The left side of the gate, I know it's, it's blocked off. I'm going to explain that in a second. But the left side would be called the gate of repentance. The right side is called the gate of mercy. 
Now, here's what's interesting. Why, why are the gates all blocked up? Well, uh, there was a few times that, that it's been walled up and then tore down, walled up, tore down. But in uh, 1530, the Ottoman Turks walled up the east gate because they believe that the prophet Ezekiel, um, who states that the Messiah will pass through the eastern gate when he comes to rule. And so um, the Muslims believe that walling up uh, the gate was going to help keep uh, the Jewish Messiah out. On the other side, by the way, of this gate is uh, you're going to see kind of a, the gate towers. And I found these uh, pictures and I thought they were really interesting because oftentimes we don't really see what's on the other side of the east gate there. Why do I mention this? I mention this because it's important to understand that these are real places. That Jesus is going to uh, cross over, uh, starting at the Mount of Olives, and go down into the Kidron Valley, and then come up and enter into Jerusalem on uh, a donkey on, on, on Palm Sunday on, for, for Passover. And so the whole city was just electrified. And he comes riding today on a donkey in such a way that you and I still have the opportunity today to receive and correctly believe who is passing by. You see, we aren't, we aren't you know, Hosanna, save now, um, uh, political or military but we are asking and, and seeing that Jesus is riding the donkey as he passes by and we're saying, Hosanna, save me now. Take my sin away. And it is so important that each of us understand the distinction because there were two crowds of people there. And here's what's really interesting is, is, is here on this Sunday when Jesus enters, uh, everyone's saying Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Do you know in just four days that same crowd is going to be crying out crucify? In fact, we will take Barabbas over Jesus. Well, here's three questions that I want to ask you this morning. And the first is, who is Jesus? I've already answered this question, but I'm asking you, who do you say Jesus is? Is he just a good guy? Is he a prophet? Was he a teacher? Was some kind of Jewish rabbi? Or is Jesus truly the Son of God? That's the first question that I want you to wrestle with. The second question I want you to think about is, where is your source to make your decision on your belief? When you consider and think about who Jesus is, what is the foundation of that belief? Is it based on the scriptures? Is it based on a professor of of, um, of religions from college? Is it based on your old high school friend? Is it based on what your spouse says? Where are you getting your information on why you believe whatever you believe about Jesus? And the third question that I want you to answer this morning is what is holding you back from acting on the belief that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, back in high school, I became convinced that Jesus is who he said he was. He claimed that he was the Son of God. He claimed that he is the Savior of the world. And based on that, my belief and trust and faith in what Jesus did on the cross for my sin, it has changed my life for the better. I have confidence in knowing that even if I didn't get the vaccine for COVID-19, even if the Lord allowed me to go home to heaven, that I would go and spend eternity with Jesus because it's based not on what I'm doing, 
but it's based on what Jesus has done and my faith that he has taken my sins away. My belief in Jesus has changed my own actions in my life. This is an urgent question that I would encourage each of us to really make sure that we know the answer to. And, and this is, you know, the question. Is Jesus the Son of God? Because if He is the Son of God and He is the Savior of the world and you have not decided to follow Him, your eternal destiny rests based on your belief. So this is one you don't want to gamble with. This is one that you want to know without a shadow of a doubt. If I die tomorrow, I know that I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. And we can know that, my friends. We can know that. I want to close our service out this morning with this video that really kind of encapsulates what Jesus experiences as he enters into Jerusalem as he hears the crowds, the, some of the cheers and the jeers, and then ultimately the entire crowd turns and says crucify at the end of the week. And I pray it will be an inspiration and encouragement for you to remember all that Jesus has done because he loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. They relieved the palms of their branches as the people's palms grasped and then brandished those leafy emblems of both festival and rebellion. These were a people who felt as though they had already spent their second, third, and last chances on zealots, men like Barabbas and that now famous Maccabean. But this Jesus, this new champion, was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey as Zechariah had envisioned him. This king was coming to daughter Zion to take the wicked Roman chariots away from Ephraim. Surely this Jesus was the one to bring God's people salvation. Surely he was the one pictured all across the prophet's hopeful panorama. So they shouted, save us please. They cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. And this Jesus would answer yes to their cry of save us, save us. But not in the way they expected. Not by the violent overthrow predicted by their palmy political propaganda. For the humility of that donkey was nothing compared to the way he would answer their shouts of Hosanna. For the path on which he rode took him not to a throne, but to a court. Not to a place fit for a heavenly king, but to the feet of an earthly lord. It was there, before another crowd, in the hands of Pilate, whom God endowed with the power to answer the shouts rising loud, demanding crucifixion for this man who was so recently avowed as Hosanna by those who had laid down a pathway of both palm branch and personal shroud. It was there that he would show how he would answer both crowds both the Hosanna save us cry and the incessant crucify. For what was missed by each tribe, by those who cried out their Hosanna boast and those who cried that this man should be nailed upon two posts, is that Jesus would say no to neither request. Instead, he would say yes to both. In fact, he would accomplish salvation by such infliction. He would be Hosanna by undergoing crucifixion. He would say yes to cries of love and yes to cries of hate. And for us, it is good news that he answered this way. For we too cry Hosanna. We too need to be saved. But we also cry crucify him. 
we also are filled with hate. We need to be rescued from our evil, but when goodness comes to us, we take what is good and by our evil, hang it on a cross. But this is how he saves us. This is how he loves us. He answered our cry of need and our cry of hate with one final yes poured out as he cried so that the sin that put him on the cross he paid for as he died and the salvation for which we asked by his yes he supplied. So come lay down your branches and come lift up your palms for the king of our salvation said yes to the night of death so that he could raise the light of dawn. He became sin Who knew no sin That we might become His righteousness He humbled himself And carried the cross That's so amazing Love so
Well, thank you everybody for joining us again online, Palm Sunday. Gosh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, just think of it, that he rode into Jerusalem as the king, as the savior. So people waving palms in celebration and just what a feeling that must have been for him. And then to know that within a week he would be hanging on a cross, and gave his life the ultimate sacrifice for our sins and for us to have eternal life. I just love the way that the story uh, just makes my heart full of knowing that Christ is there for me still and through his Holy Spirit. I want to remind you that Friday night, this coming Friday, Good Friday, uh, April 2nd at 7 p.m., we will have a special service online only. It's a great, great way to reflect on what Jesus did for us, but it also sets the tone for what happens on Sunday morning. So after three days, he rose from the dead to be at the right hand of his father. And so come join us again Friday night, 7 p.m. online. And then if you're online uh, family out there, our congregation, we love you. We'll see you Easter morning at nine o'clock as usual. If you're in the Middleburg area, we will be doing a live service 10 a.m on the lawn, weather permitting, gosh, I hope so, that we would be able to celebrate together with no masks, singing praises to our King. If it is uh, weather that's bad, we'll be inside, we'll be wearing masks, but we'll still be celebrating this great day. We love you guys, be safe out there. We'll see you Friday night, or we'll see you next Sunday for Easter. God bless you, have a great day.